I think one reason that we tend to want to have children is because it scratches that influence itch. We want to make a positive impact on a new life. One reason that when we see somebody in need, maybe somebody on the street or a picture of need on the television set, it affects something deep within us. It has nothing to do really with being a Christian so much as it has to do with being a person. When we see need, we're affected by it because we've got this human longing to influence others for their good. One reason that many of us are drawn toward service or helping jobs whereas others of us are drawn toward leadership or management jobs, is because, again, we're scratching the same itch. We all want to influence other people on our work site. Part of being human beings is this mission that we are all on, and it's a mission of influence. The problem, of course, is that sometimes influencing other people seems like an impossible mission. Can I get a witness? How many of you have ever been in a relationship, maybe a friendship or a marriage, a relationship with your child, where you see with HD crystal clarity one simple step that that person needs to take to dramatically improve their life, but they just won't budge. People are obstinate. People are irrational. Sometimes the mission of influence really seems impossible. It kind of reminds me of a famous transcript that I read about between a U.S. naval destroyer and the Canadian authorities after that destroy destroyer had entered Canadian water space just outside the coast of Newfoundland. And in the transcript, the U.S. ship says to the Canadian authorities, please divert your course 0.5 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. This is pretty important stuff. The Canadian authorities come back in the transcript replying, we recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. You can imagine not too many Navy commanders are used to being talked to that way. So the commander came back. This is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. The Canadians respond, no, I say again, you divert your course. The rhetoric is heating up. Finally, the commander of the U.S. ship says, this is the aircraft carrier USS Coral Sea. We are a large warship of the U.S. Navy, and I'm the commanding officer. Divert your course now. The Canadians responded, this is a lighthouse your call. <laughs> we probably all had a relationship or two in our lives that kind of functioned that way, where we see exactly the turn that somebody needs to make to avoid a major collision, and yet they just won't budge. Well, for those of you who call Cross Connection home, one reason you're here is that you have a special passion to influence other people. Our mission as a church, our vision as a church, the reason this church was planted was to influence the unchurched community in our town to consider the role that God wants to play in their lives. And if you think that influencing your obstinate mother-in-law seems like an impossible mission, influencing the unchurched community, that's an outrageous mission. If I would recommend one book that every Christian these days ought to read, it's a book called Unchristian. You can get it on Amazon or any bookstore. And in this book, the author spent several years and several million dollars compiling a bunch of research in order to take the pulse of the unchurched community, particularly what unchurched people in their homes right now think about church people. The results are not encouraging for people like me who were born and bred in the church. Jesus said in John 13, 35, All men will know you are my followers by this if you love one another. But did you know that the top three characteristics that unchurched people picked out when they were asked to describe Christians are number one, 92% said Christians hate gays and lesbians. 87% said Christians were judgmental, and 82% said Christians were hypocritical. Those were the top three characteristics, characteristics that the unchurched community chose to describe the Christian community. This is not encouraging at all. But the good news is that whether or not you bought into the vision here at Cross Connection and you're bought into that passion to influence the unchurched community, or whether you're just a dad or just a business owner or just an employee trying to make a positive difference of influencing your family, your employees, people in your job, friends and family. The great news is that the Bible helps us out. Jesus himself shows us how our influence over other people can be maximized through one simple few. It's the power of simple, sincere invitation. 
If you've got your Bibles today, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew. If you don't have your Bibles, don't sweat it. We're obviously going to have it on the screens for you to refer to. The book of Matthew in the New Testament is all about the life and teachings of Jesus. A big sweeping overview of what Jesus was all about. Jesus' life story. And chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel are among the most important and revolutionary pieces of literature in the history of writing. This is a body of teaching that's traditionally referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus doesn't call it a sermon. It's more like a campaign speech, really. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is describing what life and human relationships ought to look like in the Christian community. Now, in the first two chapters of this speech on the Mount, chapters 5 and 6, Jesus spends time breaking down what relationships ought to look like inside the Christian community. Relationships between members of the Christian community. But there's a shift that I want you to pick up on in chapter 7 that we're going to dive deep within. And the shift is that in chapter 7, Jesus turns to address how members inside the Christian community should leverage their influence to relate properly to those outside the Christian community. Now, let's get this in our brains. This is a time thousands of years before now. This is a time long before there are many, many Christians who are major influencers in society. In fact, when Jesus speaks these words, there are only a few hundred followers of Jesus in existence. And guess what? People are suspicious of it. People think they're dangerous. People think these, these folks aren't mainstream. A lot of people are saying, you need to stay away from those followers of Jesus. They're insurrectionists. We don't know what they're all about. So this is a pressure-packed situation for these early followers of Jesus. And in the middle of that pressure, Jesus lays out a pathway to influence. Jesus shows his followers how even under pressure and suspicion, they can make a positive difference in the lives of people who are not yet a part of the Christian community. And Jesus' entire pathway hinges on one principle, and it's the principle of simple, sincere influence. Simple, sincere invitation. So as you turn to your outline today that you received when you walked in the doors, I want to work through five simple principles of influence that cohere around the simple power of invitation. The first step in our pathway toward influencing others is to recognize that being right is not a pathway to influence. Being right is not where we start influencing other people. Now this is very counterintuitive, and this has been a very difficult lesson for me to learn along the length of my Christian life, and particularly during my time in Christian leadership. I don't know if on your job you have ever had to take one of those like personality tests to see how you get along with other people. Raise your hand if you've ever had to do that. They're a bunch now. They're really popular. You may have heard of the DISC test, and there's a lot of others that kind of mimic that. When all the personality tests, I'm what's called a type A high D. Do I have any brothers and sisters in the house? High D. That means that I relate best and most comfortably, comfortably with other people when I'm bossing them around. Like when I'm bullying them into trying to, to get something done that I think they ought to do. I'm sure the staff here at Cross Connection could already attest to the fact that I struggle with being overly dominant in my relationships with other people. And so I have had to learn the hard way over and over and over again that that does not work as a starting point for truly influencing other people. Now, I may get a lot done, and it may build me into being a pretty decent leader someday, but when you start out with somebody else, that high D stuff doesn't work. Bullying someone into life change is never the beginning of the pathway to influence. Now, on the other hand, I want to be clear that Jesus is not saying, mind your own business, as our mom has taught us to say here in middle Georgia. Jesus is not saying, with our culture, just be tolerant of other people. Let's dive into exactly what he says in Matthew chapter 7. Let's read the first few verses. Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? Jesus says it doesn't matter if you're right. It doesn't matter that you are absolutely correct that your brother or your sister or your wife or your child has got something in, your, in their eye that you could remove 
that would significantly alter and improve their vision, their ability to function, their ability to be a productive person. Jesus says it doesn't start with just digging into their eye and saying, look, I see exactly what's wrong with you. Let me get that speck out of your eye. Jesus says, no, it starts with, 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 with backing off that home mentality and instead meeting them in the place of their need. Now look at the next verse. You hypocrite, first take the, take the plank out of your own eye and only then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So Jesus is saying that his followers are going to be people of influence. They're going to remove specks from the eyes of folks within their circle of influence. They're going to help people with their vision. They're going to help people improve their lives. But it doesn't start with a judgmental posture, right? Because judgmental posture is more about me being right, which is a very powerful emotion, by the way, than it is about the needs of the other person. I love what St. Augustine said. He was a great fourth century thinker in early Christian thought. He simply said, when I judge, I am blind to my own evil and to the grace granted the other person. Being right may be important, but it's not the first step toward the pathway of influence for the followers of Jesus. The second principle we see in this pathway to influence is that real influencers accept the possibility of rejection. Real influencers accept the possibility of rejection. Once again, this is cutting way against the grain of my high D personality. I don't know about you. Look at the very next verse. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Here Jesus is making clear that there will be some people out there who will not accept our influence, even though it may be valuable, even though our word of counsel, advice, or wisdom might be absolutely transformative in their life, some people just will not see the value of that influence. In the same way that a pig is not hardwired to recognize the value of a pearl, even though a pearl would represent an early retirement to the people that Jesus is speaking to, pigs would never understand the value of the pearl. Jesus says some people are just like that. You may be extending a word of counsel or a bit of advice into their lives that would really help them out, and they just don't see it. They don't see the value. They can't accept it. When you encounter someone like that, Jesus' instruction here is pretty clear. He says, do not give. Do not throw. If somebody stonewalls you when you're trying to help them, when you see something in their life that could be improved and so transform them for the better, if they stonewall you, if they throw up that blank stare, if they make it clear that they're not interested in your advice, Jesus says, just back off and wait on God. It's not about you being right. It's not about your ability to influence them on your own. It's about their receptivity to the influence. Well, the third principle of influence that Jesus dives into in the next few verses, and really this is the primary principle, the fuel of influence is invitation. The fuel of influence is invitation. Look at the next verse. Verse 7, Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be open. Now remember, Jesus is not talking about prayer here, okay? I know this verse sometimes gets interpreted that way, that we're to ask God and so receive. That's not really the context. Jesus is still talking about how we relate to people who reject our influence, how, how we relate to people who we really could help, but they're stonewalling us. They don't want to be helped. They've got a big speck in their eye, but they seem to not want it removed. Jesus, said if you, Jesus says, if you want influence... Somebody like that, it's going to happen through the simple power of just basic, sincere invitation. Not ramming anything down their throat, but asking. Ask, and you will see. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Just like I would never barge through my neighbor's door and just walk in my neighbor's house, I would always knock and wait for my neighbor to open the door. Jesus says, people work like this. And Jesus is the greatest teacher in the world because he understands how people are wired. He understands how to influence them for their good.